Good morning. Good morning. Who's here to worship? Amen. Amen. Everybody. Now, I want to say it before I forget. I typically forget YouTube. I want to welcome everybody that's watching later today on YouTube. Yeah. Yes. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, hit notifications. You'll know when the, the video goes live. And share the video, most importantly. We, our time is limited. We need to reach as many people as possible. So, Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you gathered us together to worship you. We just want to praise, honor you with all we do. In Jesus' name, amen.
<laughs> Sorry, I wasn't here for practice. <laughs>
Yeah, I like this song. We are the Jesus people. Amen. Amen. Give it, if you're a Jesus person, give yourself a hand. Welcome to church. Woo. Thanks, praise band. That was awesome. Who worshiped this morning? Go ahead and raise your hand. Raise it out there in YouTube. We welcome you. Okay, here we are. We've worshiped. We've prayed. And now we're going to find out who read their Bible this week. If you did, raise your hand. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Don't cheat yourself. Another week goes by, another week goes by, another week goes by. Years go by. Boy, if I'd only known the, some of the stuff God had for me in that Bible, what a difference it could have made on some of those hard struggles I went through. Amen? So, don't cheat yourself. Uh, today we will continue our journey through the book of Acts. Uh, we, we were in chapter 16 last week, and we talked about the miracles, and we talked about looking for miracles, and sure enough, we found some. Plenty of miracles in the chapter. Uh, who looked for miracles this week in their life? If you did and you found some, just raise your hand. We got, we got not as many as read the Bible, but that's cool. It may be, if some of you read the Bible, it would have been a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> I got to laugh. I got I to got, see. It's, oh, well, I wasn't trying to make a joke out of you. You're doing a good thing. You're doing a good job of that on your own if you're not reading your Bible. Uh, okay, I'll leave that one alone. Okay, chapter 17 this week. Here in chapter 17, we're going to focus on our approach to sharing the gospel with different people or different groups of people. Not everyone's the same you talk to in this world. I think you figured that one out. Yeah, I get a lot of people looking at me going, oh, I figured that one out. Long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if, you, if you've missed any of Acts at all, you can check it all out on YouTube. Uh, the YouTube channel is Get Solid TV. Three words. TV is just two letters. Get Solid TV. Take you right there, and like Phil said, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and if you hit the notification, your phone will actually ding when the video comes on. Just as a reminder, hey, check church out. Title of the sermon today is Know Your Audience. That's the title of the sermon. And this kind of takes me back to when I was in college. I took a class called Intrapersonal Communications. It was considered... Easy class, someone said. It was considered an English course. Mine wasn't so easy. I had an awesome professor. This class was actually life-changing for me. And, you know, that's because of the professor. Uh, it was one of my favorite classes. guy's name was Professor Zink, Frank Zink. And what made it so good is he loved the subject. You know, you ever, you ever been taught something by someone that could care less? <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, eh. This guy loved it. I mean, he loved it. And so uh, the thing about knowing your audience, uh, when you're communicating to people, especially if you're communicating something as important as the gospel, you need to really speak at their level. You know, you wouldn't go into the kids' church up here and break out the book of Revelation and talk about all this prophecy. You know what I'm saying? They would be like, oh. maybe they'd run scared to their parents. So... Knowing your audience is very important. You don't want things to go over their heads. You don't, you don't want to bore people to death. You don't want to talk about a bunch of stuff they don't even care about or believe in. You know what? You might run into someone that you're trying to share the gospel with, but they might not believe the Bible. Well, don't go quoting a bunch of Bible verses. They don't care about that. You, you see? Okay. So anyway, that's kind of the thing. Um, and one important thing, and I think we're going to pick it up here in the chapter, is it's probably best not to start from a point of disagreement. 
You see what I'm saying? Like, don't pick the thing you disagree about and make that the conversation. <laughs> I bet if you try, you can find a point of agreement. And Paul's going to show us a nice little example here in chapter 17. So let's bow our heads and pray. We'll get into this. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much once again for a time and place to, uh, to gather together as your church, uh, to come in a, as an assembly of a family, a community, where we come together and care for each other, and, and then we worship you, and then we look to you, and we look to the Bible for teaching and guidance. So Father, this day we come to you now and we pray that you teach us from your word. Anoint my lips to preach your message Give us all ears to hear it with and a heart to receive it with, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. And so I'm going to talk just a little bit about the chapter because I'm not starting out in verse 1, but the missionary journey continues. We've been on a missionary journey. Uh, now it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and they head to, uh, this is a nice word, Thessalonica, <laughs> Thessalonica, uh, okay, anyway, I, I'm trying to make you feel better about not, not pronouncing these words, because I, I can't pronounce them real good either, but Luke stays behind, he stays behind to continue the work in Philippi, where we were at in chapter 16, I'm not sure if I pointed that out real good last week, but you notice those names, Philippi, Thessalonica, right, those names, uh, they become major churches. And this is why we will have the books in your Bible. If you look, you'll find First and Second Thessalonians. You'll find the book of Philippians. These are the places. This is when those churches started. And then Paul will later on write back to them. We have those books. So keep that in mind as we're going through Acts. This isn't some journey that doesn't take people somewhere. This, is, this isn't a fruitful, fruitless thing that he's doing here, and they are doing. They're planting churches. They're uh, building up the kingdom of God. We're going to start reading in verse 16, keeping all those things in mind. We're going to find Paul by himself here. So now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, so the rest of them stayed behind. Um, Silas and Timothy stayed behind. And Paul went on. He waited for him in Athens. Uh, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So this is Athens, Greece. This is the big, the big city in Greece. It was under Roman control, but the Romans kind of left it alone. They kind of wanted, Athens was a cool place, let's not mess it up. You know, so they, they left it alone. It was the cultural center uh, this is where all the thinkers wanted to be. The thinkers, you know, you would go to Athens if you thought you could learn something or teach something. They had education, fine arts, they had philosophy, and they definitely had religion. They had a bunch of religion in Athens. And that, so it was like freedom of religion type of a thing, in a way, kind of like this country, kind of a thing, in a way. We're going to see that pointed out here, too. So, you know, you could kind of think Athens, maybe, kind of like America a little bit with this self-governing. and But virtually every deity known to man could be worshipped there. You could do all kinds of worshipping to all kinds of things. And Paul, he looked at it, and he, his spirit was stirred in him because he just saw all this idolatry. He, Paul only cared about one thing. He cared about, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you saved? And when he looked at that, he's like, boy, these people are lost, really lost, you know, given over to idols, okay? Let's look at 17. So since, since that was what was going on, he wasn't just going to wait around for the other guys to show up, okay? Therefore, disputed he in the synagogues, of course, Paul always goes right into the synagogue. Why? Because he's a Jew, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He can argue the faith with anyone and point out into their own scriptures that they probably didn't get it. So he went into the synagogues and he, argued, he had disputed or reasoned with the Jews. And since that was a minority in Athens, uh, he went with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that would meet with him. So anyone that would talk to him. So Paul's 
He's going to cover the synagogue, but then he's going to go out and meet with people and let them know about the Lord Jesus Christ because we're supposed to have all this freedom of religion, right? He wants them to know about Jesus, but then I won't read all these verses. He runs into some of the thinkers, the philosophers, and they're not quite sure about what Paul's saying here. They're like, hmm, I don't know what he's saying, and they don't even really know if he's allowed to say it. Remember freedom of religion? <laughs> but sometimes you're not allowed to say certain things, even if you're quote-unquote freedom of religion, even here in Athens, okay? Here in this country, too. So they take him to court. They just take, well, we don't know if you, what you're talking about or even if you should be talking about it, so we're going to take you to court. They take him to the court, the people making decisions. We'll take it off at, down at 22. When he's down there, he's going to talk to the, the court about this. Tell us about what you're trying to tell us. So, uh, 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens... You people of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Superstitious, You're too religious. You have too many idols. There's too many things going on here. You're confused, okay? He says that you've confused the subject of religion with all this stuff. 23, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, all these altars and idols and all these things they worshipped, he said, I found an altar with the inscription on it, and it said this, to the unknown God. He says, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, you don't even know who he is, you've even said you don't, because your, your altar says unknown, to the unknown God. He says, him I declare unto you. So they said, what are you trying to tell us? He's like, okay, I'm going to talk about the guy you don't know about. The, uh, this unknown God that you already worship ignorantly. You don't even know about him. I know about him. And I'm going to tell you about him. Paul just found a point of agreement. Did you notice? They already worship the unknown God. So he didn't come in there and say, oh, you're all wrong. Everything you do, you're, you're crazy. He did come in and say, you got way too much idols. You're too religious. But I did find something that you might have right the unknown God, and let me tell you about him. So you got this point of agreement. We should take note of that. 24. So he's going to tell them about him. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He starts to talk about God. And where does he start from? Creation. Didn't he just start from creation? He said, God that made the world and all things that are in it. God created everything you see, this unknown God. So he started from creation, which is interesting. But it's really not if you think about it, because the enemy of God had not quite unleashed the attack of evolution on mankind yet. That, that attack hadn't been unleashed, evolution. On, on mankind. So uh, he could start from creation. It's going to be harder for you to do that. Every one of you, it's going to be harder. Evolution, I'm just going to break it down to people listening out in, in YouTube maybe because I think most of us agree here. Evolution is not a science. Evolution is a religion. That's what it is. It's a religion. You must have faith to believe it. And it makes it a religion. They don't have the proof they want to have, but they want you to have faith they have it. <laughs> uh, maybe I don't have the proof I want to have when I pull open the Bible, but I want you to have faith to believe it. I don't make any bones about it's a religion, Christianity. It's a relationship that you end up having with God. It meets the definition of religion. So does evolution. I'll probably talk about it more here at the end, but... Uh, Long story short, the real science involved in all this is math. Math is a real science. You can prove it. You know, that's why they call it a math proof. You can prove math. And those math proofs actually prove evolution did not happen, if you really care to check it out. Uh, so then he tells them, he starts with creation, and he tells them that God is, 
He's not tangible. You see, you noticed what he said there in 24? If I go back and look, he says, uh, The Lord of heaven and earth that dwelleth not in temples, you're not going to find him in any of your temples that you've made, and, and he's not made with hands, he's not touched with hands, he's not tangible. So, so they're starting to get a picture, because he's starting from ground zero with these people who he's talking to. 25, he says, Neither is he worshipped with men's hands, though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He says, you don't serve him with your hands. You, don't, you didn't make trinkets that looked like him. You can't, like, uh, go make him a sandwich and feed him. You know what I mean? That's, he's not that kind of God. He's, he's trying to... Remember, he's dealing with people that don't maybe don't catch on to all these things. 26, so he keeps on talking. He says, and hath made of one blood, but he does something real cool here I'll tell you about. He, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So now he talks about God being in control. And he he really comes against a misbelief that they had, uh, which was that uh, many of the Athenians believed that their blood was superior. That's why they were so smart. That's why Athens was such a cultural center. They, they were better. They were just smarter. They weren't the same as the dumb people on other places in the earth. And Paul combats that right away, and he says, God, this one that created everything, he made of one blood all nations. So he combated their misbelief of superiority, and then he points to God's control. One blood, God even controls the time when people are born. God even controls the place where people are born. All under God's control. So he wants to get them thinking about an all a God that made everything and a God that controls everything in a way. On You see, uh, it's, it's a new thought for them. Go down to 27. And he gives the reason why. Why would God control those little aspects? He says that they should seek the Lord, everyone who's born, if they happily might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So the reason God controls certain things is so people can find him. Some people walk around in this world confused and think God controlled certain things in their life to keep them away from him. And sometimes it seems like that. People fall on hard times. Why does God always do this to me? Why, why if, if this always happens to me, God's trying to keep me away from him. That's not the case at all. And quite in honesty, God's trying to draw you to him. And everything that happens, happens, not everything, because we've got you know, free will that's at play on the earth, and that's not what Paul's talking about, but he's talking about the reason you're here in Athens is probably because God thinks this is where you're going to find him. That's why I'm here talking to you. And I like the way he says, uh, happily if they feel after him, if they search Search for them. Feel around. And what picture do you get if I'm feeling around for something? I must not be able to see, right? I'm in the dark. That's what people are in the dark before they know God. They can't see. But you can feel after God. And God made it so if you really feel after him, you'll find him. So he paints that, that awesome picture. I'm going to read a few verses pretty quick. So keep up. Uh, 28. And he, he says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. So now he's quoting their own poetry that they already like and love. Because it's, it's pretty good. For in him we live and move and have our being. Yeah, those guys were on the money. They just didn't know. It was about the unknown God. As certain of your own poets have said, and in the, in the add to it, he says, For we are also his offspring. So their poets have already said that offspring. For in so much as we are the offspring of God, we ought to not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art 
or man's device. We don't get to make God. So they had all these, they actually had idols they worshipped that they thought that chunk of gold was a god. You see what I mean? And he's like, if we're his offspring, how is this chunk of gold the dad? You know what I mean? Why aren't we gold? He's trying to bring around some reasoning. 30, uh, he says, and the times of this ignorance, God winked at. God, you were ignorant. You did all this stuff. God's willing to overlook it right now, he says. God winked at it. He said, but now, now that I'm here, now that I'm telling you about the unknown God that you ignorantly worshipped, now that you're no longer ignorant, after I get done with you, he's saying, he has commanded all men everywhere to repent. And the song we sang was so appropriate, right? It's your kindness, Lord, that brings us to repentance. God's not mean to us to make us repent. He's kind to us. He's drawing us, right? 31, because he hath appointed a day, and this is why you must repent, this is why you must be saved, he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, he's already talked about Jesus to him earlier, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. He says we have proof. If all this has taken place, Jesus Christ came and he was raised from the dead. So show me your proof of your gold trinket that you say is God, that I can just walk up and knock off the shelf. Must not be so powerful. And we've got the proof of someone dying and coming back to life and promising us eternal life through that power. 30, let me read a couple more verses. I got time. Uh, 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. So here we go. This is what happens. If you share the gospel with a group of people, especially, they, they're, they're all different. They're not all the same, and they don't all have the same reaction. Some mocked, and others said, we will hear more of thee again on this matter. Huh, that's pretty interesting. I need to hear a little bit more about this. And some are like, ah, that guy's nuts. I'm going back to my gold trinket. I like that God. He doesn't talk back to me. Some people like a God that doesn't talk back to them or tell them what to do. Right? And so Paul departed from amongst them. He's like, I've said my piece. Good. I'm done. Apparently, I can keep talking about it. They haven't censored me totally. Like, that was part of what this court thing was. Should we still allow this guy to talk to people? Uh, how be it, so here we go, this is the fruit, how be it certain men, and we know women, clave unto him, and they believed, and it mentions their names. It wasn't fruitless. That little speech made some of them believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul knew his audience. Boy, he started out from nothing. He couldn't get up, go up there and say, the God of the Bible, because they would have been, they didn't care about the Bible, you see. It's, it's always good to know your audience, and it's always not the same audience. Brother Kenny shared a story with me this week. Uh, it was an interesting. Um, he met someone who he appeared to believe in God, maybe even said as much. But when the conversation went on, he found out they didn't believe in heaven or hell. I mean, you, you'll encounter people like that. Right? So if we, if we took Paul's you know, his strategy out of this chapter, uh, we'd find a point of agreement. So where's the point of agreement? Well, you both believe in God. Right? So, so you're like, oh, so you do believe in God, though. Yeah. Okay. Where does God live? You see what I mean? If you don't believe in heaven, well, I don't know. He's out there somewhere. Okay, well, that's somewhere. I just call heaven. Maybe you call it somewhere. And now, we're, believe, now we're, we're agreeing even more as we go along, maybe. And maybe it opens up all kinds of pathways of conversations of who knows what, but we start at that point of agreement. At least that's what Paul showed us here. The interesting part about it is, and I touched on it a little bit earlier, is I do know something about every person that you will encounter, almost, I think, almost every single person that you're going to encounter, I know that they have been indoctrinated with the religion of evolution. 
as if it were fact. And they do this in the schools. They do. They do it other places too. I got this interesting little book that I've had since 1976. My mom's down in kids' church, or she'd be like, wow, you still have that book? I do. She bought me these childcraft books. They're, they're awesome. 1976. What kind of facts were they teaching me back then? Well, if I turn back to animals from the past, it says, imagine fish with legs. Once upon a time, sounds like a fairy tale, right? <laughs> As it is. But they're teaching it as fact here. This is a factual book. This isn't a religious book. Okay? Once upon a time, they re there really was an animal that looked like a fish with legs. It was about 400 million years ago. It swam in the warm green waters of swamps and lagoons and also walked on the muddy shore. Now, this is the, the part. The creature was probably... Ooh, at least they said that, was probably the first four-footed animal in the world. It was also one of the very first amphibians, the great, great granddaddy of today's walking animals, which I guess would be my great, great granddaddy. Amen? Do I, I walk, don't I? 400 million years ago. 1976. Okay. Um, so, it's been out there for a long time. What most people don't realize is that the, the theory of evolution first came out even before Darwin talked about it. The first theory of evolution really existed because of racism. The evolution of the human. You see, black people, they weren't as evolved. That's why we could own them as slaves. This is what they believed before our modern. They believed in evolution. They believed in the evolution of the human. And if you just happen to be white, you are more evolved. Feel good about yourself, evolved. I guess if your skin's darker, feel bad about yourself. See how crazy that is? Crazy, okay? Some races just more evolved. No one talks about that anymore. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about that's how evolution thought process started. Do we? Did you hear any talk about that? Maybe some didn't even know that until I just mentioned it. So it may have started as a tool of racism, but now it is scientific fact. Now it is. We know it's true. We changed the human part. <laughs> uh, maybe the fish. I... Okay, so I want to ask you something. If you've been indoctrinated, and most of us have because we went through school, do you honestly believe that someone can know for a fact what happened a billion years ago? For a fact. We know a billion years ago. How do you know that? Well, we have the scientific proof. Where? Where do you have the proof? Well, we believe. Oh, you believe. You believe through, see, now we're back into the religion, okay? So this thing that started as racism, this isn't, the enemy had noticed that it was a great weapon against mankind. So no one can tell you what happened a billion years ago was scientific fact. They just didn't record it. What were they recorded it on? <laughs> uh, they... How about a million years ago? You think they could tell you what happened a million years ago? Do you? Some people are out there, oh yeah, we know, we know through the fossil record, and we know. Do you? Do you know? Why can't they tell us how they built the pyramids? For fact. They got a lot of theories. They've tried to recreate some stuff. They kind of think they know sort of maybe how, kind of. Aliens. Alien seems to be the, the, the good one because then we, can, we don't have to recreate it. Oh, they just they did it with anti-gravity. They moved these big rocks. That was only a few thousand years ago. You see what I mean? They can't tell us that. But we're supposed to believe they can tell us 400 million years ago in my childcraft book. And I had my, my uncle the fish with four legs. <laughs> we laugh, right? We laugh. And it, it takes faith to believe that, folks. 
It's a religion, it's not a science. It is a, what it really is, is a state-sponsored religion, which is really makes it really against the Constitution. There's a reason they don't teach this Bible as fact in the schools, because we're not supposed to. But yet they teach the religion of evolution as fact in the schools. So it's, it's state-sponsored. It's not only state-sponsored, it's state-mandated. They must teach it. And I talked to some people this morning, and they didn't realize it. The, the last Supreme Court ruling on it was in 2005. Most people probably don't even realize that. There were many states that were starting to put stickers on the science books that said there's a possible gaps in this theory of evolution that was going to be taught in this book. Some of the things may not be completely, can be backed up scientifically. And there is alternative theories to how we got here. The Supreme Court said that is illegal. You cannot put them stickers on those books. Law of the land. Can't warn it. Furthermore, in that ruling, the Supreme Court said a teacher cannot question or criticize from the classroom, front of the classroom the theory of evolution. Even if, even if they were doing it with a scientific journal. So even if tomorrow someone came out and said, boy, we've got it now, we've got the proof, there's no way in the world it happened the way we've been teaching it, it cannot have, we figured this out, and they put it in a journal until another Supreme Court action came or Congress did something, you, the, the teachers could not take that journal and present it in the public school classroom. They cannot. You cannot, even through a scientific journal, question or criticize the theory of evolution in a public classroom. That was 2005's ruling. State-sponsored religion? What do you think? <laughs> I know that about the people you're going to encounter. They've been indoctrinated. You have too. Of course, we believe the Bible. We, we, we are set free from that from that nonsense, right? But I realized as I, this really wasn't where I was going to take this whole sermon until about three days ago, and God said, this is where you're taking the sermon. If you want to know your audience, you want to know something about your audience, let me tell you something about your audience. They've all been duped with this lie of evolution. And a lot of them aren't duped anymore, but it's rampant, okay? So last week I used the Romans Road to Salvation at the end because the, the youth had been to summer camp and that's what they had learned and I thought it was awesome. But that might not work for someone who refuses to believe that the Bible is true. And many people refuse to believe the Bible's true because evolution is true. See what I'm saying? So just like Paul didn't use direct quotes from the Old Testament to the Athenian court, uh, maybe we shouldn't use direct quotes to someone who is so against the Bible. At least at first, right? So one good way to someone that says, I don't believe none of that Bible. We all came. We, uh, it's proven. Evolution's proven. It's science. You know, and you can say, okay, how did we get here? Well, it was, the, it was the, your uncle, the fish with legs. And then maybe you can start pointing out, do you really think they got proof of all that? And... You know, and then maybe do what I did, talk about the, can't even prove the pyramids, I'm not sure. Or you can go down a road like, have you ever thought there was a designer to this world? Have you ever looked out and saw a design? How about the tree leaves? Man, that's a design, folks. That's not randomness. You see what I mean? How about just everything around? When I see a car drive down the road, I know it's a Ford. Why? Because I know the kind of cars they are putting out these days. When I see a tree, I know God made it because I can see his design all throughout. So you could, there's that. There's the purpose for everything. There's the, there's the mathematical impossibility of, evol of evolution. Now you can Google this, and they've censored Google a lot. Google will say it is mathematically possible. Okay. <laughs> and it's mathematically possible for me to poop golden eggs. 
but you'll probably see me up here next week preaching because I'm going to have a hard time getting it out. <laughs> it's about how mathematically probable it is. I, I did read something from a mathematician who said, okay, this theory of evolution, the way it is, and how things had to co-evolve, all the insects had to evolve with the plants. They all rely on each other. All the plants had to evolve with the animals. They rely on each other. All the animals had to evolve with each other because they rely on each other. All the little fish had to evolve with the big fish because they eat the big fish eat the little fish. So you can't have big fish without little fish. You see, so all that craziness, and not to mention the giraffe, how that's an impossibility. <laughs> this mathematician said the mathematical probabil probability of evolution getting us where we're at now with everything working in harmony the way it is, the world sustaining itself, is probably about as likely as a tornado going through a massive junkyard, taking all the pieces it picked up, totally assembling a jet airplane, land and dropping it, totally fueled up, started, and ready to fly. Now, if that's mathematically probable, so is evolution. So that's, that's what the mathematicians say. And if they say it too loud, they get censored. And all their journals get stripped from the publishing and can't say it too loud. So, and then of course, I'm running out of time, but I could even get into the language of DNA, which has really stumped them now. They, and they don't want to talk about it at all. They really don't want to talk about the language of DNA. Your DNA in your body, the sequence and the way it fits together, and when they really put it out, it, it meets the criteria of a language. And if that's the case, at the, that the origin of a language is an intelligence. You can't have language without an intelligent thought. So if there's a language in our building blocks of our cells... It got there from an intelligent. And so since they're so stumped at it, that's why they're pumping this alien things. Okay, we still evolved, but the aliens dropped, dropped the DNA. <laughs> they dropped it into the water that was on the ocean, and, and then everything evolved with that language. See, they just get crazier. They want you to have more faith. Okay, that, that's, that is what you're dealing with when sometimes you're going to share the gospel. You need to know your audience because it's not always as simple as the Romans road. I wish it were. I wish we lived in a country where everyone believed the Bible. You know what I mean? I wish you could just point to the scriptures and you could prove it out. But the enemy's done a, he's done a work. But greater is he that is in you that is in the world. Amen the Holy Spirit still reaches out to people. People still feel around in the dark, like Paul said here. They can find God, and you know how they find him? Because he's not far from any of us, Paul said. He's right there to be had. And there'll be times where you can share with someone who doesn't believe. If you're thinking and you're knowing your audience, you can tailor that conversation in such a way that the Holy Spirit can take you places, places that they'll believe in and they'll come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. Because that's what it's all about. That's what the book of Acts has been about. That's what troubled Paul when he looked at Athens. I think if Paul was here looking at America, he would be troubled. I think his spirit would be, ooh, we've got to reach these people, these people who are trapped with idols. Amen. Next week will be chapter 18. Stand if you would. Know your audience this week as you talk to people. You looked for miracles last week. This week, know your audience. When you talk to people, if, they do have a little, if you have a chance to have a little conversation with somebody, listen to what they tell you. You'll learn some things about them. And then when you, the time comes to share the gospel, maybe you'll start from a point of agreement. Amen? And maybe it'll take you places. I pray that it does. So bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a time and place to gather. And we, boy, we thank you for your Bible. What a blessing we, that you have preserved it all through the ages. And you, you just have it right here for us. And Help us value it more. Help us look to it more. 
Help us apply the principles we find in there to our lives more. Help us be your witness in a, in a world that seems to be full of idolatry. Father, help us to, to find points of agreement when we come into contact with people where we can really be your witness just like the Apostle Paul did here. Help us to, uh, to walk in the Spirit more, Father, and walk in the flesh less. That's really what I'm praying for us this week as we go forward, Father. I want to pray every spiritual blessing on everyone in the sound of my voice here in the sanctuary and out in YouTube watching. I pray that the Lord bless you. I pray that, I pray that he keeps you. I pray that he makes his face shine upon you and he gives you peace, that peace that passes all understanding, Father. Everyone around may not understand it, but you understand it. I, want, I pray that you're blessed as you walk out these doors, or you walk out the doors where you walk out. I pray that you're blessed when you walk into the doors you walk in, and then in every place where you find yourself amongst people, I pray that you are a blessing to those people as God is blessing you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.